My presentation is about electroencephalography and how action potentials that are generated in the brain can be related to EEG signals. Initially, some background information will be mentioned that may be helpful for the understanding of the EEG function and how signals from the brain can be detected, further translated, and interpreted. So, what is an action potential? We could start by saying that the brain is an organ that mainly functions through electrical stimulation of neuronal cells and the transmission of these signals throughout the rest of the body. Action potentials are generated and transmitted by the opening and closure of successive voltage-gated ion channels in the membrane of the neurons. In order to trigger an action potential, synaptic activity and postsynaptic potential is concerned. When an action potential reaches a synapse, the neurotransmitter is emitted in the synaptic cleft and binds to the postsynaptic receptors. These receptors selectively allow the passage of ions which can either depolarize or hyperpolarize the postsynaptic membrane, EPSP or IPSP respectively. When the membrane potential is near the resting potential, the channels are shut, but if the membrane potential caused by a strong enough EPSP increases above the threshold potential, they open, causing a sodium ion influx. The all or nothing principle should be noted, which states that since the stimulus is greater than the threshold, an action potential of a standard power is initiated, independently of the power of the stimulus. Specifically, when the membrane potential increases above the threshold value, an influx of sodium ions causes further depolarization of the membrane as positive ions accumulate into the cytoplasm and successive ion channels open by reversing the membrane potential following a positive feedback loop. Simultaneously, an efflux of potassium and chloride ions is observed, which has a much lesser impact on the generation of the action potential. As the membrane is further depolarized and the action potential propagates along the neuron, the preceding ion channels begin to close and the concentration of ions begins to return to their initial values as potassium voltage gated channels open enhancing the efflux of potassium ions and causing a depolarization. During the following period, called the refractory period, active transport of ions via sodium potassium pumps return concentrations of ions and cause restoration of the membrane potential closing the voltage-gated channels and inhibiting the backward movement of the action potential. A brief summary of the action potential transmission can be divided into three steps. Step 1. Transmission of action potential through synapse and opening of sodium voltage-gated channels depolarizing the membrane. Step 2. Closure of sodium voltage-gated channels and opening of potassium channels leading to repolarization. And Step 3 refractory period and restoration of membrane potential. These three steps form a loop that is constantly repeated propagating the anxious potential from neuron to neuron. In order to further understand how an EEG signal is generated from an action potential, the gross anatomy of the brain must be introduced. The brain is the main part of the central nervous system and is enclosed within three meningeal protective layers and the skull and is cushioned by the cerebrospinal fluid. Within the central nervous system, there are ascending and descending fibers which transmit information in the form of action potentials to and from the brain respectively, sensory and motor neurons. In order to be able to analytically translate an EEG signal, someone must have a general knowledge of the anatomy of the brain and the specific neuronal pathways that you can find within it, as well as the regional functions of the brain since EEG signals come from regionally oriented electrodes. The brain comprises of three main parts, the cerebrum, the brainstem, and the cerebellum. The cerebrum subdivides into two hemispheres which relate to the opposite side of the body. The hemispheres are further divided into four lobes, the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the parietal lobe. Action potentials moving through random axonal units can be considered as a group of currents moving in random directions, so in total we can assume that they cancel out. So, if we cannot measure currents from action potentials, how is the EEG recorded? Most likely, the reason that causes stimulation of electrodes is the current detected from postsynaptic potentials into cortical apical dendrites. 
when an action potential reaches one end of the apical dendrite, it causes a postsynaptic potential that can depolarize the membrane and cause a current to flow through it. A collection of such active neurons are required to generate an EEG signal from scalp measures. This collection of neurons can be modeled as a dipolar current source with a specific orientation. Variations in the strength and orientation produce a wave-like outcome. To take measurements, we use electrodes. These electrodes can be scalp electrodes, cortical electrodes, or deep electrodes. Most commonly, we use the 10 to 20 scalp electrode system. 21 electrodes are placed in specific locations on the scalp. In order to minimize noise, specific filters are used, known as differential amplifiers. The way the signal is recorded is called the montage, and we may use the three different montages, the common reference, the average reference, and the bipolar. The common reference is the difference between an active electrode and an inactive one, which is similar for all channels. The average reference uses the difference between an active electrode and the average signal from all the electrodes. The bipolar links electrodes together, usually in straight lines from front to the back. Resulting waves can be divided into four categories. Alpha waves, which appear usually occipitally in normal relaxed adults. Beta waves, that appear frontally and parietally indicating alert adults. Theta waves, which represent children and sleeping adults and delta waves, which appear in infants and deep sleeping adults. The study of the AEG measurements is the best source that enables diagnosis and classification of epileptic activity and seizures. It is the most convenient clinical application since it is clean, cost-effective, and extremely efficient approach. Epileptic activity may be provoked using hyperventilation, visual stimulation, or even sleep deprivation. An indication of such an activity is a spike and wave trace. Seizures may be characterized as generalized when they affect the whole brain and partial when they involve one lobe. Study of the EEG recordings and detection of spikes and sharp waves indicates a seizure and by using a to the common reference montage after several repetitions, the conclusion may be taken on the epileptogenic area of the patient's brain and the degree of severity of the disease. By combining the measurements from the EEG record, a topographic analysis and a possible medical history of the patient, a diagnosis can be provided on the possible cause of the epileptic activity in the affected area. Thank you.